Let, uh, let me open our morning in prayer. Lord, you are great and gracious. Thank you for your creation. And for that pause before the sin in the garden, thank you so much for two chapters of Genesis here uh, before that, this day we study now. And uh, I just pray that you would give us strength as we open our eyes and see and look and hear what you have to say and what you've shown about yourself to us here. For it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. So, um, you know, this little outline is uh, the briefest of reviews. I, I've, we've spent a lot of time on the creation of the cosmos. I'm, I'm saying it's such a good and uh, a gracious uh, thing, uh, an affirmation. So we'll just re begin review with uh, last week's. We spent two weeks on Genesis 2 which sort of uh, identifies the, uh, the human condition. And this is more about uh, the creation of the humans. And, and you can see from this, it's a, it's a very up close and personal thing. We've got another, another uh, piece of art coming up that uh, we saw last week that is just so very almost tender and I think sets the conditions. This is why we say uh, God is personal and personally concerned with us because of these few words right here that give us this personal connection. Uh, God's breath in our nostrils and God breathed into the nostrils the breath of life. Such a beautiful little phrase and, and he's interacted with humans in a way that he has with no other kind of creation. Uh, and we're given this beautiful little, little space all prepared carefully for us, this sacred space and remember those words, God put them in the garden to blank and blank, to tend it and to keep it, to work it and to guard it. And that, that second word is always reserved in the Old Testament for the work of priests in the temple. Although the first word is really context sensitive. So just wanted to remind you of that sacred space. And uh, again, uh, all this, this word Bara, when, God, when it says that God created the humans, male and female, he created them, it again uses that word bara that to, uh, God created, uh, to create, which is really also in the Old Testament reserved for God's work. Such a strong, uh, powerful statement and careful control of the words there. And then it turns out that as we find ourselves male and female in that way, uh, with the, the, the key word, one of the key words we saw last week was, an, uh, so uh, God created the woman as an ally to the human, one corresponding to the human. So uh, the same in nature, essence, and being, a great strength there in that place. Uh, made in God's image. And then, of course, we have this priestly work in the garden. It's, it's like to, yes, to work it, to keep it, but to ushers others into this sacred space. And then here, uh, as I prayed a moment ago, it's just so nice to have a second chapter of, of this glimpse of innocence in the garden so that uh, we, we get a chance to dwell in it for a moment. The creation of the cosmos, the creation of humans. And it's like we have a pause there, and now the drama is set. And of course, the... Uh, Here's, here's another uh, kind of up-close and personal image of this. Uh, modern, this guy is still doing work these days, but this sense of uh, breathing into his nostrils. And I think it's, this is actually close, but not close enough. It's like, it's like he got, he's putting an oxygen mask on us. That's, that's how close that, that Hebrew language is. This isn't close enough, but it, it's cl so close. And intimate. Now, we have the human condition laid out before us with the two trees. There's so much going on here. I really puzzled over this and have just soaked in it and, and thought about it uh, for months, really, and in Genesis for years. It's, it's almost like a parenthetical phrase. He created a garden in the east for them in Eden and rivers went out from it. All, and that's like, now here's the parenthetical phrase, and it's in one of the translations actually puts it in, in parentheses, 
And in the midst of the garden was the tree of life and also the tree of knowledge, good and evil. So the creation of the cosmos leading up to, with the capstone, the creation of the humans, the placement of the image of God in the temple, and then here we are, the stage is set. It's, 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 it is the beginning of the drama. And uh, we come today to that third chapter of Genesis where the, the, more <laughs> the humans as actors step onto the stage. Well, qu quite, quite a debut they've made, quite a big debut. <laughs> so this idea of the tree, uh, last week uh, I, I answered the question, is, is this a literal tree? Are these literal trees? It's hard to think that they could be, although later in the chapter when, we talk, when God talks about putting a guardian angel at the edge of the garden uh, to protect the tree of life, lest the human take from it and live forever. So it's another, it's another form of mercy, it strikes me. But uh, So they could very well be two real trees, but they're trees that, of which we find it hard to conceive. And this, uh, this, these two trees together, it sounds, it sounds as if the two are bound up together. We'll look more at this, uh, the idea of the knowledge and the Jewish concept of knowledge. We talked a little bit about that last week, but I've got uh, more depth on that in the Old Testament. Any thoughts, uh, review? Creation of the cosmos, creation of the humans. Thoughts, questions? Got, got a lot to do today, to, too, so if you're... I'll just go right on ahead unless somebody's going to interrupt me. Okay. Here we are. You know, it's, it, I think it's worth phrasing this carefully, partaking of the tree. That's, uh, that's what it's about. It's not the tree of knowledge. It's the tree of knowledge, good and evil, but it has fruit. And contemplating the tree isn't really, it, that's not off limits. We can contemplate the tree. But it's partaking of the fruit of the tree that's kind of scary. And then the curses, the judgment. So there's some, there's some really some backstory here. Uh, not everything is explained because as the serpent enters the stage, we, we see a lot of things going on that we don't know anything about. So what I wanted to talk about here was uh, uh, some of the things we learned in the Old Testament, and we'll, we'll see some of that. But uh, there are a lot of ideas unexplained, and we just get hints of that in the Old Testament, really. There's much more story going on about God's creation of the angels. Evidently, God's creation of the angels, we believe all things are su uh, subordinate to God. So this is an image of uh, Raphael warning Adam and Eve about the dangers of Satan in the garden. Now, a lot more, a lot more backstory here. So, this is from Isaiah 14, and we see I've highlighted the five I wills. So it's kind of a classic way of talking about Satan's pride and arrogance and his fall. Uh, how you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn, you have been cut down to the earth. You who have weakened the nations but you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Nevertheless, you will be thrust down to Sheol, to the recesses of the pit. Those who see you will gaze at you. They will ponder over you saying, is this the man who made the earth tremble? who shook kingdoms, who made the world like a wilderness and overthrew its cities, who would not allow his prisoners to go home, the prisoners in exile. Um, look, look again, uh, the world like a wilderness, the, uh, the trackless waste in, in Genesis. These texts are bound up together too. So this is backstory on Lucifer. Uh, in Hebrew, it's actually le Satan. Le Satan. So it's that very, uh, that very word. Never is it a proper noun, though. So it's not, it's not really designated as a name, but it is this one, the accuser, also translated the accuser. So 
more backstory. So there's the five I wills. And Milton depicts in Paradise Lost, does some great backstory. And he had a couple of fantastic artists that wanted to, uh, to illustrate Paradise Lost. And so one of them is Gustave Dore, oh, Doré probably, and the other, uh, William Blake. We've seen a lot of their works already, I think a couple over the last few weeks, and we'll see more of William Blake's and Doré today. So Satan rebels and is struck down from heaven. So Satan, uh, as beautiful as the morning star, so uh, the, the, the highest of creation, and, but the humans are something different. The angels do not mirror the image of God. So, so clearly there's, there's, some, there's some other kinds of jealousy going on here. Struck down from heaven, fallen, barely recovers. But then, and some other, uh, some other uh, things we haven't seen is uh, he rallies the demons and escapes hell. And now here, he's found earth. He's located paradise. He sees the serpent. And the story goes, possesses the serpent. So just a, just a lot of backstory there. You want to just talk about that for a minute? We've got, I've got more on the serpent and Satan and, uh, and others, but any comments on that backstory? I'm wondering why the um, scripture says um, it's just a man who shook the earth. It's not a man at all. Yes, yes. Just <laughs> took it from the, uh, I, I've been using a variety of translations. It says it's an NIV as well. That was the, uh, that was the uh, slide we just showed in Isaiah 14? Yeah, the man. I, I re yes, it clearly says that. Yes, King of Tyre. And I think it's a dual concept, personally. Yes, yes. Good, good point. Very, it's uh, ambiguous a bit. But be, because the prophets are trying to say things in captivity without you know, going over the line and getting their heads chopped off. So they're being guarded. Okay, now, still, before, still, before we get to the story, notice the last phrase of chapter 2 is the introduction to chapter 3. It's again, uh, it's deftly bracketed there, as I say. Uh, so it's as if, uh, so Satan sees Adam and Eve there and, uh, and is prevented from going to them and yet again escapes and comes back into paradise. But uh, this, this, phrase that they were, uh, they were naked and not ashamed. I thought I had that up here. Sorry about this. So, um, and the man and his woman were in the garden and they were naked but not ashamed. So that's the, that's the bracketing, the intro of the story. And he said to the woman, well, oh, uh, sorry about this. Got the I've got some slides, slides uh, that I thought I had to, another caption there. I'm missing a slide. Okay, so the first line is, and the serpent was the most subtle or the most shrewd or crafty of all the beasts of the field. And I have that on a couple of title slides as we talk about Satan. And he said to the woman, though God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. And it's as if she interrupts him there. Well, of course, he's overstated it. And the woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the garden's trees we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it, and you shall not touch it, or lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, Oh, good, I've got that repeated. You shall not be doomed to die, for God knows that on the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will become as gods, knowing good and evil. So, so, you know, part of the story is the nakedness. So, you know, these are, these are descriptive shots. So, but, and, and so we're not naked, but we're embarrassed for those who are that we see in the art. Um, 
And the woman saw that the tree was good for eating and that it was lust to the eyes and the tree was lovely to look at and she took of its fruit and ate. It's a very spare translation there. Uh, and our classic translation is good, lovely to the eyes, good to look at, good for food and desirable to make one wise. We'll go into more of that. And she also gave to her man, and he ate. And the eyes of the two were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking about in the garden in the evening breeze. And the human and his woman hid from the Lord God in the midst of the trees of the garden. William Blake here. And the Lord God called to the human and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard your sound in the garden, and I was afraid, for I was naked, and I hid. And he said, Who told you you were naked? From the tree I commanded you not to eat. Have you eaten? And the human said, The woman whom you gave me, she gave me from the tree, and I ate. And the, Lord God, and the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I ate. And the Lord said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed be you of all cattle and all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust shall you eat all the days of your life. Enmity will I set between you and the woman, between your seed and hers, and he will boot your head, and you will bite his heel. More of this. And to the woman he said, I will terribly sharpen your birth pangs. In pain shall you bear children, and for your man shall be your longing, and he shall rule over you. Cursed, you shall not, uh, cursed be the soul for your sake. And then he said to the man, oh gosh, cursed be the soil for your sake. With pangs shall you eat from it all the days of your life. Again, the curse to the man is the same with pangs of, with pa pain. Thorn and thistle shall it sprout for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow shall you eat bread till you return to the soil, for from there were you taken, for dust you are, and to dust shall you return." A lot going on there, and then, and then suddenly, this, this, it's, a, it's a change of tone almost. And the woman called his, and the human called his woman's name Eve, for she was the mother of all that lives. And the Lord God made skin coats for the human and his woman and he clothed them. This is a scene of the judgment of Adam here. I don't know where the horse comes from. It's as if the horse maybe were an integral part of tilling the fields. It, it's, that was a very late development. It wouldn't be ancient. It's, it's William Blake's idea, not necessarily ours. And the Lord God said again to the heavenly court, to the heavenly hosts, now that the human has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, he may reach out and take as well from the tree of life and live forever. And the Lord God sent him from the garden of evil to till the soil from which he had been taken. And he drove out the human and set up east of the garden of Eden the cherubim and the flame of the whirling sword to guard the way to the tree of life. Even this the cherubim looks a little, not, not quite as intimidating as we might fear, but. Yeah, I think this evokes the flaming sword. We've got a couple of others that evoke that flaming sword. Michelangelo says it all at once. You, it's, hard to, it's hard to cut this up into pieces to have part of it represent the story. It's like Satan giving to Eve or being a part of her partaking of the apple. That's real insight on Michelangelo's part. 
Adam there too, as, as if close by in this one, but there's, uh, there are other questions. There's so much we don't know. The angel driving them out of paradise. The, um, the Hebrew word for garden, the root of it, uh, stands for protected space. So, so truly we say of the garden that it was paradise, which is walled garden. Totally legitimate terms for that, to get into paradise. Now this one, just going back to this, going back to into the story, this one, this one raises some questions in me. Like? Yeah. What? Where was Adam? Where was he? See, like, he, like it's he, he, he's off in, he's off in space here. Never, it might as well be Never Never Land. Where was Adam? I heard a pastor one time say that he, he was there next to Eve, and basically, when the serpent was beguiling Eve, he, he said, well, why not if, if she does it? And, you know, she can do it in mm-hmm. crash test. You know, he was responsible for putting his foot down and did not. So and she both, too. So we both, well, true, but we both, as man and woman, fall. It's not just her. Yes, he tried yes. He to scapegoat Oh, clearly. But, but he could have reached in yes. at that point and did not. More, more thought on, on that here. You know, so let's, let's not, bl- we're not, we're not blaming Eve at all. I'm just kind of, where was Adam? It's like he was MIA, yeah. missing in action, AWOL, huh. asleep at the switch. Yeah. Could very well be. We don't know. The text, it's not a simple text. It's not, an- it's not trying to answer all of our questions. Could this, could this be one of her questions? Where were you when I needed you? Or maybe, I was always fine around that tree, but I was having a bad day. <laughs> could very well be. Just musing about this story. Kind of, this is just kind of soaking in it, thinking about it. What angles are there? It's, it's such a spare story that sets up a frame and, uh, and artists through the centuries have colored it in with their ideas. Okay, question. Okay. Sure. A thought. Sure. It says the serpent was crafty. Yeah. The serpent's no dummy. So my guess is he split them off. I've got a lot on the serpent here. Okay. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if Adam really was preoccupied with something else gorgeous in the garden. And, and that he got her alone. Yes. And it doesn't necessarily mean that Adam was any smarter and, or, or that she was dumber, so he, he picked on Eve. Yes. It was just that he picked somebody, but they split them off. And, yeah. and it's a case for why two heads are better than one, and so the serpent got one of them alone. So the frame of the issues, let me get to questions in a minute. The frame here is God creating something that is not himself in creation, and then humans that are not himself. Well, a human, and then humans, and then, of course, they create more humans. Now we hear he also, at some point, obviously created angelic beings, and there was a conflict there. It's like, it's like things are really out of hand there, but we don't, we don't believe that. Let me, let me just take questions in a, in a bit here. Clearly, this idea of interaction, so and, and I have just, uh, the, you, I've already talked about this rejoinder to the, the idea that God has created something that is not himself. He answers that through incarnation by becoming part of his creation. So, but of course we're jumping to the end of the story there. It's very difficult to stay in these places and consider these places of pain. But it's part of considering our human condition. Uh, I, don't, I didn't give this enough, uh, enough attention here. The two trees, the tree of life, in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge, good and evil, they are bound. It's as if they're entwined. Not, not really, because we have partaken of the one and been prevented from the other. But if they're, they're sort of bound up. Their fate is bound up together, particularly for us. Carla? We were uh, taught that because Eve was not totally made in God's image alone, because the rib of Adam was taken, she became the lesser, mm. easier mark mm. for the serpent because he already knew that there was a weakness within her. 
I don't think there's warrant for that in the text. It's, there's, it's, so Adam's vision is that, it's as if he, he might describe it, I was, I was, in a vision I saw I was cut in half, and then Eve was presented to me, his other half. Was he vastly different from a gender point of view before that? I think not, because he was incomplete and searching for an ally corresponding to himself. But we go back to the statement which says, then the Lord covered them with flesh, and then he clothed them. When we covered her with, yeah, yes, yes. Yeah, he made that nakedness. Uh-huh. It may not be this form that we're, oh, that mm-hmm. we're looking mm-hmm. at. It's that, that soul. Yes. Spirit of yes. who the Lord is. Soul is right at the heart of this, and that's this dialogue. What I think that, that, that we're looking at. But I, I mean, I, I agree with the lady that said that Satan was smart, uh, the serpent was smart enough to have them separated. But I also believe that he <clears throat> could easily convince Eve more than Adam. I think he watched, I think he observed before he actually made his attack. It wasn't. We like to think that all of this was yeah, know, yeah. in seven days, and, and we have no idea what the time span was, yes. but Other, by the same token. Yes, go ahead. I would argue just the opposite. I would say that he needed, the serpent needed Eve to convince Adam. Mm-hmm. Man or rent. Mm-hmm. And that she was, because she was the smartest one. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Seriously, so we need She would convince him, whereas he convinced Adam, Adam and Adam. Yeah. Go ahead. I have a question. So God said when you eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you will die. You will surely die, yes. Then he put an angel that guarded them from eating the tree that was going to give them eternal life. Yet we believe that we have eternal life. But it sounds from the story that we lost that. Well, it's... it's do, you, do, you, do you know anything about it's, uh, When we are taken from away from the tree... It says it's spiritual death that could that is in mind there. They did not die immediately. I think it would be inevitable death. That is death becomes inevitable. But in the garden they have access to the tree of life, and so doesn't that make sense? Where God is, if we enter into that space, we will have life. Um, we have been because of our transgression. We have been exiled from the garden. And that's the condition of the, the Hebrews in much of the Old Testament. Before Jesus, I mean, he reopened, if you would, the paradise. That's what we believe, that's what we teach. He, he, he has overcome death. Yes. Wait, Sally. Uh, oh, I was just, just uh, thinking about how, I wonder how a theologian or would explain that, uh, you know, so many of the ancestors or whatever that are they talk when they talk about they start talking about the who begot who and how many years they lived you know these people lived for hundreds of years and then at some point in time it is there's something that happens where they where god limits your limits life to yes yes years, i think right after the flood okay, yes so um but just this um so I'm, it feels like a reference to you're going to die sometime. Yes, yes. Versus, you know, that, I mean, an awareness that you're going to die sometime. Yes, Your yes. Physical body's going to die. And that's that was part of the my comment. Naked but not ashamed. It's very that's really understated. And we'll we get into the drama, we'll immediately see that is a bunch of understatements. Joe. How do we think the serpent knew what question to ask? Yeah. Yeah. That, that they didn't eat from it? How did he know what? Good, good question. I think it's worth asking those kinds of questions. And just like some, uh, some of those we, we can't really tell. I've got a couple of slides on the serpent here. Just thinking about this. The, uh, the word serpent there. The serpent, well, the words, and we'll, ha- we'll get to that one next too. The serpent was more subtle. So now we're talking about subtlety. This word too is at the nexus of knowledge and action like so many of our words are in Hebrew. 
Um, they're bound up with how you live. Fool's anger is none at once, but a prudent man conceals dishonor. A prudent man, well, maybe he doesn't want to expose the hurt or shame of someone. A prudent man, that one, conceals knowledge, keeps quiet what he knows. So maybe cautious in revealing. Wisdom of the sensible one is to understand. The prudent one for, foresees the evil, thinking, looking ahead, and Ooh, take a step back, hide yourself. Frustrates the plotting of the shrewd so that their hands cannot succeed. For your iniquity teaches your mouth and you choose the tongue of the crafty. Boy, we've got some, some crafty words coming out there. Highly context sensitive definition here. Suggests this idea of thinking, foreseeing, planning. It's, it's completely opposite of the way of creation and how words, how God uses words. And in this we see this premeditation. The serpent has a, a robust premeditative creative relationship with knowledge. Knowledge for evil. It sort of, it ties the trees together. This, this exploitation of knowledge, this exploitation of opportunity. Now about serpent, um, again, William Blake, after the Paradise Lost illustrations, this, this he goes into some uh, vi visualizations of the red dragon, Satan, and maybe triumphing over Eve in this way, and yet she's, she's clothed in the sun. The serpent, the serpent inhabits, well, Satan inhabits the serpent. Uh, Moses' staff becomes a serpent, and Moses fled from it. Again, uh, in scenes before Pharaoh, um, I cast down my staff before Pharaoh, and out of it comes monsters, the serpents, and, uh, and, and Pharaoh can do that too, but Moses' serpent eats the rest of them up. Surely the serpent will bite. Oh boy, does it. And then this, this passage in Numbers, it's so puzzling, but it reveals something here. One bitten by the serpent, if they look to the bronze serpent, they lived. And uh, this word for serpent is a sound alike with the word for bronze. Shiny, we are attracted to shiny things, things that glow, glimmer, well, maybe also forged in the heat. He led you through the great and terrible wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground where there was no water. Contrast with Eden, a well-watered, protected garden, but, and certainly not a terrible wilderness. These Hebrews had great imaginations. And now in Revelation, sort of jumping ahead to the end of the story, but just to flesh out the idea of the serpent, that great dragon, the ancient serpent, the one called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world, it's binding us all up in this same act of deception that entrapped Eve, binding us all together, was thrown down to the earth and his angels along with him. That's the end of the story. It's like we don't like staying here in this third chapter of Genesis. It's hard to, be, it's hard to, to, to look at it. And what is this more on knowledge? We just, we just hit it so briefly the other day. Hadat. I tried to understand the stupidity of wickedness and the insanity of folly. Look at that. Con so context sensitive that they call it insanity. So it's, it's, uh, it's like light taking on, taking on the colors of, taking on the appearance of colors around it. Judah, I, and, and I had to go look all some of this up, where, where we get this, uh, these short references, it's just not enough to really understand the context, so I, I broaden it out to, to bring these things together. Judah defends the cause of the poor, so all went well. Is that not what it means to know me? Knowledge being bound up with not just action, 
but who you are. Shall be satisfied by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. The suffering servant uh, chapter of, of, uh, of Isaiah. And then in, in something that so evokes creation, day after day they seek in delight to know my ways. Day after day. They seek in delight to know my ways. That, that, that pursuit, there's, there's real um, joy in that pursuit. So this pursuit impacts your, your mode of being. The idolater is confounded with no, in knowledge. And then Hosea, for I delight in faithfulness, not simply in sacrifice. I delight in acknowledging God, not simply in burnt offering. In acknowledging God, knowledge and acknowledging. Uh, it's bound up in the context of what we're talking about. Bound up with life. Your identity, which is exactly what Genesis 2 is about. The heart of it. Identity. Now, um, temptation by the serpent. Let's just consider what's, what's going on here. Good question. It's, it's so... Milton's uh, vision there of Satan seeing the endearments of Adam and Eve, uh, it's, it's as if he's had time to observe. And that dig, oh, has he really said you may not eat of any of these trees? It's like, it's, like, it's just a twisted sister kind of a thing. Um, and then... She responds and interrupts him. It's a, it's a beautiful dialogue there. And Kurt, it's, she doesn't even let him get the thought out of his mouth because he's impugned God's motives. And she's, well, uh, so it's so her response there. But I'm, I'm focusing on the words of the serpent here. He said to the woman, surely you will not die. He is contradicting her version of reality. This is deception. Who are you going to believe? Who are you going to put your faith in? Is it deception or is it, is it actually true? I, that's worth asking. <laughs> and I, I've, I, I don't think I put it in here. It's a little cheeky yeah. to ask, is the serpent right? Let's, hang on, let's go to, I just want to get through this and we, I got some questions, space for questions. Again here, uh, just another characterization of, of Satan. Better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. That's his attitude of destruction. He, the serpent, uh, of course, uses words, certainly, certainly not to create, but to twist and distort. <clears throat> what, what, do, what do women do? but share the fruit. Uh, so women are, are often more involved in agriculture than men, and so that's what, that's what it is, sharing the fruit. Men may bring back the results of the hunt or the story of the battle, but we do hear that women are more involved in agriculture than men. Uh, you know, the American farmer kind of puts that idea to rest, so it's, it's not all one thing, but, but this, is, this is a fair way for ancient peoples to depict this scene. And here we have the predict predicament. I think I could, I, we could take a, a, your question there. Well, I think Lucifer says that because he was not killed. God didn't just go, okay, you want all these things and you want to be me. He just banned him from heaven and sent him down to the garden. So. Lucifer already knew how angry he made the Lord and did not die. Yes. I think that's part of that, that statement. And when we talk about serpents, I think that picture by uh, the artist is more because he says, after the evil happened, you shall crawl on your belly. The serpent before that had yes. feet and looked like a frog and whatever. But I think that those are the two differences. But since he did not die, he surely knew that the Lord wasn't going to kill his most coveted profession, 
which was humans. This maybe is what's at issue. Maybe yeah. because you and I were talking about that interview with Jordan Peterson and, and the uh, woman on the BBC, how she would rephrase what he said and, and literally un, uh, basically put words in his mouth that wasn't what he said. I just noticed, I don't know if this is for the first time, look at his answer, go back one slide and look at Satan's answer. He says, surely you will not die. And then look at the second half of that. Yeah. It is not connected to that. For God knows when you eat it, you will, your eyes will be open and you will be like divine beings. So basically the first half of that is a misdirection. Yeah, yeah, you said you're going to die. Yeah. But then I'm going to take it in this uh, completely not answer your comment and misdirect you into this thing about, well, you'll be like God's. You'll be like God himself knowing good and evil. He's kept that from you. Yes. Uh, We've got some more slides considering this predicament. and. Uh, uh, the predicament, because you obeyed, this, this word, uh, I, think we ha I think I have it on this slide here, uh, because you heard and listened to your wife, <laughs> not me, and ate from the tree, this is now we're in the judgment scene, which tree? Well, the one I told you not to eat from it. And then this, this deed itself, the story in the garden is related, related with such devastating economy. Don't try and read it Left to right, that's what we do. The Hebrews don't do that. And she took from its fruit and did eat and gave also to the man with her and he did eat. Eight words in Hebrew. It's like all, all those first two chapters of Genesis are all undone with these two, with these, with these eight words. And our translation gives it like 21. Such, such economy of words there and deft description. It's, it's painful. It's, a, it's, like a, it's like a bolt of lightning or a cascade suddenly downhill. But so we look at this sin in a couple different ways. This is Paul reflecting on the creation story we've been thinking about. And it's so strong of a summary. He's, he obviously inhabited this worldview. Although they claim to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for an image resembling the mortal human beings or birds or four-footed animals or reptiles. Clearly reference to idolatry there. Therefore God gave them over in the desires of their hearts to impurity, to dishonor their bodies among themselves. And they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creation rather than the creator, which I think was Adam's choice. And then Romans 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. So we tend to think of this as relating to the, the Ten Commandments and the Torah. But it, it aptly describes the situation in the garden. We've got so much more on that too. But God comes looking for the humans. It's like one of the, the, the very Greek, the very Hebrew uh, passage where I took that little snippet of Hebrew interlinear text actually titles the section of judgment, God arraigns the humans. And if this were, and so the, the language of the law court is very important in the Old Testament. We see a lot of it. Um, but this would be like the, the hot pursuit of the police team. Now, but that's, that's, I think that's mischaracterizing it because it's, so it's not that. He comes to them in the cool of, well, it, our translation from, all, from uh, since the 16th century, the King James, in the cool of the day. But recently it's been retranslated during the breezy time of the day, which would be the cooler evening times. Uh, you know, the breeze off the ocean or something like that. Um, God called to the man again. Oh, what, what a beautiful thing. So, so I, think it's not, I think it's wrong to characterize it as hot pursuit or um, tracking the man down. He's, he's looking for them and calling for them. Where are you? And the man replied, I heard you moving about in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Well, now we see how understated the man and his woman were in the garden, naked, but not ashamed. 
Because right here we see, bef before shame, he gets to fear. And, and what is nakedness but vulnerability? It, being exposed and vulnerable. Fear. This awareness of vulnerability exposed comes with shame. And we, we haven't even brought up the subject of death yet. Adam hasn't. And here, okay, so it's not, a tr it's not tracking down the human or hot pursuit. But this investigation is actually... A, a ju the judge is fair. Do you mean the judge rushed to judgment? It's not a just judge. To, uh, the number of questions this, this addresses in the, in the later stories of the, the Hebrews is, is mind-boggling. Will, will the judge be fair? Well, a fair, a fair judge will have a proper investigation. <laughs> Who, what, when, where, why, and how? Where, where, are, where are you? Who told you you were naked? Did you eat from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? What is this you have done? The Lord is full of questions. Um, one of the things that I, I'm wrestling with is how many conflicts are presented by this. And one of the conflicts is uh, the idea that God is omniscient. Because uh, we're at, I mean, it's as though he didn't know before he set up the tree of life and the knowledge of good and evil that uh, which, which they would choose. And as though he isn't as powerful as the serpent, that he couldn't have cornered the serpent or kept the serpent from. I mean, it, it's the, what did he, <laughs> did he ordain that all of this would happen? And if that is true, then what does that mean? The what question, does that mean to these, uh, you know, this, the seeking of the man? I mean, he knew. He knew all this was going to happen, supposedly. I mean, at least in our, I mean, I'm assuming that, that uh, you know, that's kind of an underpin of, of study of the Bible, isn't it? That he's omniscient, that yeah. he's all-powerful, yeah. that he, you know. So, and the, the hard way of putting the question that I, I said a, a week or so ago was, why did you create everything if you knew it was going to go all wrong? Or did you? Right. So, and it's, it's this, this text illuminates these, all these questions for us, or at least it's practically begging us to consider them. Well, one, one of the things, I don't know if you want to go there if you have been, but there's an argument that when God created man and woman, that, that we think of them as like us. Little, you know, teeny little pink things running around these three-dimensional spacesuits that we've been given. Praise God. Perfect. As they are as in the fallen nature. But the thought is that, that Adam and Eve were, the, were equal to the intellect. And when we thought about Satan being crafty, so Yeah, so yeah, were. yes. Now, we get into the, okay, then what was the, the good and the evil part of it yes. that they didn't have, you know. And, and I don't <coughs> think that, that it, it, it's deceptive. At least it has been for me to try to think of them as like me. They weren't. They were created perfectly at that time. Yeah, yes. They did not have original sin. Uh, yes, I wonder, I wonder if we had a question mark here that we could see the asking question. I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, okay, so I just want to think more about Eve. All about Eve. <laughs> what does she really know? And more, more questions about this. Um, you know, what did God know? What does Eve know? What did Adam know? Uh, we won't go to all of those. I'm just thinking about Eve right now because I that 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 William Blake image really really struck me. What, where was Adam? Where were you when I needed you? Does she even know that she was naked? And we we can't really answer the question because the text doesn't say. It only says they were naked, not ashamed. That doesn't mean they didn't know they were naked. Well, but, this whole naked thing goes beyond just clothing, of course, okay? Which, as you mentioned already, yes. it talks about this vulnerability. Yes, yes. About this accessibility. I've lost, you know, I know I've been disobedient. I've lost that relationship with the Creator God. I mean, whether it had been a day yes. or a, a thousand days or how many years, who knows? We don't. We don't. Scripture doesn't tell us. It's not clear on that. We don't teach it. We don't believe it. At least I don't. That we know the exact time frame. But there was this going on part, and, and that 
nakedness, I think, in the way it's translated, as I understand it, goes, as you said already today, beyond just simply you don't have clothes on. Yes. You know, and this whole and big leaf thing and the whole animal skin thing, and we've heard the teachings on the animal skin clothing to hide that the shame of their fallen nature. <laughs> they now have original sin. More about Eve. Oh, just the, the classic analysis of the text. We've heard so much. Good for food, attractive to the eye, desirable for making one wise. Um, good for food, it's only natural. It's, it's, only, it's only natural to be. Is it good for food? Because that's what the, the trees were full of. But the, words of, the use of the word good here is so ironic in the context of the first chapter. Good six times, good, 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 and then very good. Oh, how ironic. Uh, attractive to the eye, desirable for making one wise. She's, she's evaluating, what's it good for? It's like already we, we see we are tool making, we're creatures that use tools, because she's interested in how, how, what it's good for. And this idea of a delight to the eyes that which is intensely desired. And it, our translation actually said lust, and so this is the origin of that. Uh, appetite, and sometimes specifically lust. Eyes have been mentioned in the serpent's promise that they will be wondrously opened. Now they are linked to intense desire. In the event, they will be opened chiefly to see nakedness and, of course, experience fear. There is an internal parallelism in the verse here. Lust to the eyes, lovely to look at. It's, it's a bit poetic. A correlation between verbs of seeing and verbs of knowledge or understanding is common to many languages. One of the uh, scholars behind the, uh, the Hebrew Bible, current translations, what did she really know? Could she possibly have known what was at stake? The big stick, the big threat was death. You will surely die. And she said, you cannot eat from it, and you must not touch it, or you will surely die. This is like humans to add to the law. What could she possibly have known was at stake? It, we would say that she had a better idea of what's at stake if there was death in the garden. So seed bearing fruit bearing seed bearing fruit suggests the garden was not all life. There may have been death in the garden, death of plants, we haven't heard about death of animals, but we certainly do by the end of this story. I think the eyes of both were opened, and they knew they were naked, is the dawn of self-consciousness. So Genesis 1, the creation of light, physics really, time, the sea and the dry lands, the interaction of which creates weather and agriculture. And in the... Uh, Next chapter, Genesis 2, male and female, the human identity, the trees thereof, the human predicament. This text covers all the basic questions, the dawn of self-consciousness and judgment. <coughs> well, we got uh, just a few more minutes, so we'll keep going, but we've, I've got uh, some, some more slides. Let's see. Can't tell. We're on 30 of 39. Okay, so we got through a lot. We'll just do some. We'll just cover some of this stuff next week, and just finish off a bit today here. The curse of the serpent. But an unexpected, unlooked-for promise here. But it, it's bound up with conflict, enmity. Though the serpent is by no means satanic, as in the lens of later tr tradition. The curse records a primal horror of humankind before this slithering, viscous-looking, and poisonous representative of the animal realm. It is the first moment in which a split between man and the rest of the animal kingdom is recorded. Behind it may stand, at a distance of cultural meditation, Canaanite myths of primordial sea serpent, boot and bite. The Hebrew uses what appear to be homonyms. The first verb meaning to trample, and the second identical in form, probably referring to the hissing sound of the snake just before it bites. You will strike, he will strike its head, and he will bite the heel. So this, this promise is bound up with 
hostility, conflict. And the woman's penalty. Conception, sorrow, multiplied. That's the most economical way of saying what it's about. And the, the high stakes of having children in this world, whoo, wow. Man, uh, and in pain you shall bring forth children. And then this, this uh, our first, uh, our oldest translation is this. Your desire will be for your husband, but he will rule over you. That's, uh, that's tricky. Uh, this, this is acceptable, at least for this, uh, this scholar here. You will want to control your husband, but he will be dominating. Huh. Isn't that the story of all of us? It's, it could very well be reversed, too, because you will want to dominate, but you will be dominated. It's not prescriptive, too. This, we, we really have to separate that. It's not the good. That and then we'll just, this will be our last slide for today. The statement, your desire will be unto your husband, but he will rule over you. If the church is the wife, then the husband is God. And I think that that's what that proclaims to you. That he, that God but this is as a result of sin, so we, we wouldn't call it ideal. We would call it part and parcel of the hostility and conflict introduced. It's part of the curse. I, w I was just going to mention on the omniscience thing. God is omniscient. He knew that they would fall. What's his alternative? If he had the same love that you and I had, he'd say, bag it, I'm not going to do it at all. Yeah. That's his only option. Yeah. I'm not sure what. In other words, if God foreknows that Adam and Eve will fall, he says, this is going to be trouble. It will cost me my son. Therefore, I choose not to create at all because that's his only choice. If he, if he had the same love that we had, if I, if I thought I could create someone and they'd turn around and hit me and spit on me, I'd go, I'm not going to create them. Because I think, but his love is unknowable. And because of that, he creates anyway. Yeah. I don't understand that. Yes, yes. The thing is that he's responsible. Oh, sure. He's responsible, that, yes. I think he'll take that. This isn't uh, that human beings created. We didn't create our destiny. God created our destiny. Right. Well, so there's no uh, that's, it, it's, <laughs> he, uh, we might, I think that we have to confess because we are in the garden faced with the two trees, with the tree of knowledge, good and evil, which is, it's not hypothetical. It's, we, can, we might think about the tree, but the problem is going to get the fruit of it. So we are actors, and I think responsible. There's actually other parts, in the, in other parts of the Bible that suggest that God feels responsible, that he created the situation yes, where yes. we are separated from him, yes. and therefore he is responsible, wholly responsible, yes. for reconnecting us yeah. to him. That that's the overall, the overall thing is, is that he, he created the situation yes. and he took responsibility for it. In other parts of the Bible, at least other, pe other people who, who interpret the Bible feel that that's what the message was. Well, it, I think clearly in the run-up to the flood, the phrase is, well, wouldn't, wouldn't you know it? God is the first one to experience the pain that he bequeathed to the woman and to the man, these pangs. Because in, in Genesis 6, in the run-up to the flood, the inclination of humans was everywhere all the time for evil. And, and so God was sorry and grieved that he made humans on the earth and he decided to wipe it all out. So it, we see there the anguish of a troubled parent, not the wrath of an angry God. So looking into the heart of God, which I think is the best way to look at the Old Testament as the way of God revealing more about himself. You're, you're right on it there. I'm thinking along with what Sally was talking about, um, I think it was mentioned last time, Augustine's talk about the happy fall, Felix culpa, and here's, here's a quote from, I think this is Augustine, O oh, happy fault, O oh, necessary sin of Adam, which gained for us so great a redeemer. I think I have that on a later slide. Not quite that one, but something similar from Augustine. Right. So yeah. it kind of goes along with what you're saying. Yeah, very, very nice. But you can't have a relationship unless you separate it. Well, 
And other, also, you, you can't have a relationship unless you're discussing with someone other. Why name things at all? So that we can commonly refer to them. But since we all can't be in the same place at the same time, God creates something that is not himself. And then many things that are not themselves. So now these things here have relationships too. They're interacting with each other, as it were, ricocheting off one another. So, but it gives integrity to creation to let it be. And that is the permit in the garden. They were free. They had vocation, relationship, which suggests that interaction. So it's, it's, it's all of the issues. It's a spare frame for the human condition and thinking about all the things of what we know, epistemology, and what we do, or well, who we are, ontology, and then how we act. What's, what tology is that one? Thank you, okay. Thank you. More next week.